I worked landscaping with a guy who played bass, and I met Mike at a Christmas party after a show that everybody went to at the Infinity, which is really where we cut our teeth eventually. Um, and I met Mike at this party, and, and then I bailed. I bailed, I went to Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta for a year. I went to, to a goldsmithing school and learned how to be a jeweler and went back home and worked for my uncle who had a jewelry store. And that was pretty short lived. And then up here in the Northeast, there's a company called Hanoush Jewelers. And I went to work for them in their factory, making the jewelry that they sell in the stores. I was still in college when I met Aaron. It was kind of my you know, senior year of college and it was at a Christmas party. Uh, and it was Christmas in 93, I mean, I remember. And uh, a friend of mine used to have these Christmas parties on Christmas Day evening. And I remember I was, I was actually super sick. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go anyways, <laughs> try to drink this uh, sickness away. <laughs> and, uh, you know, someone introduced Aaron to me as a singer. And we chatted for a while. He didn't have a phone. I gave him my number. And while I was working there... I ran into, and it's such, it's, it's like a small world, full three. <laughs> the girl who worked at the jewelry place was Mike's roommate, who at that party that I'm talking about where I met Mike, something happened upstairs at the party, and there was, somebody kicked a candle over something, there was wax everywhere, and... Mike's roommate came downstairs, blackout drunk and furious, and looked around the room, and the only person that he didn't know very well in the room was me. I remember we left. He, he lived near this bar that was by us. I think we went there, and I came back, and something had happened, and my friend whose house was like freaked out and like threw everybody out of his house, and I he actually threw like Aaron down the stairs for something. I mean, it was like, and I, and I never saw, I hadn't seen, and I didn't see Aaron. He didn't have a phone. He never called me. I'd given him my number <laughs> and I, I went on, I never thought anything really of it. And like I graduated college, I got out and I was, you know, still trying to start a band. I actually ended up moving into that house as a roommate when I got out of college. So like a great guy to live with. Well, he was a good friend of mine, you know, I just listen, sometimes you can get a little upset over right. things, you know? <laughs> And he grabbed me and he jacked me against the wall and put my head through the wall. Oh my goodness. And, but it was his girlfriend. It's just crazy how the whole, the whole thing of it happened. It was his girlfriend that worked at Hanush. And that was how I ended up reconnecting with Mike. His girlfriend was working at this jewelry store and Aaron had gone to jewelry school. And he ran into her and asked about me. And she gave him my number again and called and that's when we got together. So it was like 10 months later right. that we got together. And I mean, I remember I was at my parents' house and he came over and, and I mean, I remember like it was yesterday listening to him sing and just been like, wait, where has this kid been? Right. You know what I mean? I heard that voice. I was like, oh my God. So he, uh, he knew a bass player. I knew a drummer and we just started rehearsing. And I think the first thing we did was we wrote like three songs because I bailed, I was gone. I had a I had a phone number for him, but I, I don't even know. I, I didn't have it at that point. I lost it. Um, and me and Mike hooked back up again. And the first thing that we did was write a song. And it was like that. You know, Western Massachusetts. You know, nineteen ninety four. All these like tribute bands were, you know, playing Friday and Saturday nights. And sure. so we learned a bunch of covers and went out and did that and always kind of did the original thing and uh ended up getting a johnny ended up stepping into the band about a year later and uh it was shortly after that we put out and tormented our first record yeah so and, you know, we'd play these gigs and we'd get paid well but we always put the money back into the band to be able to record Smart. on our band and you know what i mean and we're able to trade gigs with other bands and just try to play throughout new england wherever we could that's so cool and 
So as I understand it, and you know, I don't know if the internet's all, always correct, but I also was a huge Limp Biscuit fan, still am. Yeah, for love sure. Limp Biscuit. And so you play a show with Limp Biscuit at some point when Limp Biscuit's still coming up too. And Fred was so influential in the development of a lot of bands. So is this true that you all gave him a demo of Stain and that's where things took off? And there's a demo tape that gets passed, eventually makes its way to Fred. And he tried to kick us off the show. <laughs> just Before? From the, just, no, he didn't even listen to the music, just from the CD cover. What was it? That... Uh, it was Mike having a little bit too much time on his hands. And, <laughs> uh, and it was a, a little section in his attic. And he kind of created this little, like, it would almost be like Joe Boo's little area in that baseball movie. <laughs> but it was, there was a knife stuck in a Bible and the Bible was bleeding. Oh. There was, there was a Barbie on a crucifix. <laughs> Like, there was some crazy shit on yeah. there. At the time, we weren't signed. We were just trying to get anybody's attention, good or bad. Right. If you, you, either, you either freaked out about the cover or you listened to the music and you liked the music, either way, we were trying to get your attention. So I, I think I met John Otto first. Amazing. And John brought me in because I had, because I, you know, I might be known to smoke a little bit. <laughs> so me and John, I, I, me and John, I, we were going to partake and, and he was like, let me go grab Lee. So then DJ Lethal came into the mix. And I believe it was Lee that I gave the CD to that he went and gave it to Fred and Fred not knowing anything we were just a local opener we actually got the gig because the other local opener that they had booked for the show couldn't do it right. and we had been good friends with them and unlike a lot of the bands in the area it wasn't a competition for us we would always do well in Western Mass we always tried to get these other bands and trade off gigs so they'd come open for us there we'd go open for them elsewhere so there was a band from Connecticut that um we really liked, they were called Sugar Milk. And uh, the drummer called me one night after rehearsal and said, hey, you know, uh, Olympus is playing this place called the Webster Theater in Hartford. And uh, the first slot, so he goes, it's 20 minutes. He goes, yeah, you guys always give us, give us gigs. Do you want to do it? We're going to play it. And I'm like, yeah. And their first record had just come out. So I had just heard them. You know, Three dollar bill, y'all? Yeah. Wow. And I loved it. You know? Iconic. Yeah, totally. So, um so yeah, so Aaron, but Aaron gave Fred the demo, and Fred freaked out on him. This is we were really like twenty minutes before going on stage, and he tried to get us thrown off the bill, didn't want us to play, <laughs> and but stood there the whole set on the side of the stage watching us. And I remember Fred coming out to the main bar because that's where me and my wife were standing at the time, and throwing the CD across the bar at me. And it had been sliding it down the bar and was like, bro, what the fuck is up with this shit? You guys a bunch of fucking devil worshipers or something? Whoa. And I was like, and I explained that it was, <laughs> it was just merely for shock value. And we didn't get, it was too late to throw us off the show. But instead, he stood side stage. That's, that was what happened. He would have been on his bus. Right. He would have been. He wouldn't have been watching the local opener. You got it his attention. That, it was that freaking CD cover that got his attention. Wow. And because of it, he stood sideways, stood stood side stage, and watched our entire set. When it got over, he had kind of changed his tune and said, "Oh, you know, I love the band, but." So he gave me his number, you know, call me. So I was like, okay, well, we'll do that. So I mean, I called him, I called him. He'd never answer, never return, you know, message full, <laughs> couldn't leave a message. So it was probably about a month later, maybe a little bit longer, we were working on some new music and uh, 
they were opening for the Deftones outside of Boston. Wow. And I remember I, we had a cassette. We had just done three, three songs. And I, I said, listen, he's not asked. Let's just bring the new music up there and see. So we did the drive up there, knock on the door. You know what I mean? Wes answered and Lethal was there. And we left the cassette. Never saw Fred that night. Watched the show. It was the night before Thanksgiving. I remember. And drove home. And like two, three in the morning, my phone rang. And this cassette was in the background. And it was Fred. And he was like, oh, I love this man. Let's, you know. So that's kind of what led us to like the day after Christmas that year. We drove down to Jacksonville and spent a week with him. And, you know, worked on our music with him in the rehearsal wow. spot. When I walked off stage, he threw his f***ing arm around me and walked me down to the dressing room and told me that he was going to get us a record deal. Wow. That is wild. That changed the course of history for Completely. Rob. That night. changed our course of history for sure. And it's f***ing crazy because, again, he wouldn't have been inside to watch any other local opener. Right. Why? I guess maybe looking for new talent, but he certainly wouldn't have stood there intently paying attention for our entire set. They played a New Year's gig at a place called the Milk Bar that was owned by Danny Wimmer. Wow, shout was, out Danny. Yeah, it was <laughs> Danny Wimmer Presents. So we opened for them New Year's Eve at Danny's Bar in Jacksonville, Florida. Wow. And uh, February, we were in Los Angeles, and that's when we ended up signing with Flip Records. It's amazing. You come out on stage and you play outside, which is, you sort of improvise that, right? I mean... Not sort of. <laughs> um, when I when I went into the dressing room before our set, I was... I was trying to play the hidden track off that first record as the last extra song or an extra song in our set that night. And he was like, well, if you play that song that you were coming up with while you were at my house, writing the first four songs of the first record, Dysfunction, um, I'll come out and I'll sing it with you. Because I remember the chorus. The chorus has stuck with me that much that I remember the chorus and I'll come out and sing it with you at the end of the show if you do that song. And I was like, okay <laughs> and i walked out of his dressing room and about died because i hadn't all i had for the song was a chord progression and a solid chorus and i'd been fucking with the song playing it in in there was a thing that i used to do back in springfield before we left springfield and it was we called it jcat because it was john chris aaron tory so it was jcat um and you know I would improvise. I did that with It's Been a While, too. I can't tell you how many times I played It's Been a While with different lyrics. Only It's Been a While is what stayed. Right. And then the, ver and then the chorus would finally stay. So then I had It's Been a While and the solid chorus, and I would just ad lib, just playing local shows at like Breakers Pool Hall in West Springfield. And, right. And so I would do that with both songs. I had the, the chord progression and a solid chorus for outside. And it's been a while in a solid chorus for it's been a while. And both of those songs were just kicked around. Um, but outside, I, I had improvised it a bunch of times, but I had never locked anything in stone. So when I went out there on stage, I had the chord progression and the chorus locked in stone and the rest of it was was me improvising again. Crazy. In front of 14,000 people, <laughs> all getting caught on video as it happened. So that original outside video, where I, you can see my hand shaking, the sweat is just, it's because I was riding a bolt of lightning at wow. that moment and, and solidifying and finishing that song in front of everybody. <laughs> I think the factor in your success is you sound very ambitious, very persistent to do things like, F it, let's go to the show and give him a tape. Let's see. We don't know if he's going to be there or not. And I think that sounds like that also played into your success in addition. Well, you know, it's, you know, I remember 
you always think, you know, oh, getting the record deal, that's the, you know, you reach the pinnacle, but you really just reach the, I always say you reach the base of the mountain. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's there was all these tests we had to pass along the way, you know what I mean? And from that cassette going to him to um, going down to Jacksonville and us working with him to us going to, we played a showcase in LA when we went there in February to getting management, to getting that record deal, to... You know, even to getting, I mean, Terry Day to produce that first record or something that was, a, you know, like, I mean, I remember how excited I was that, you know, this, the guy that did, you know, Pantera and Deftone was going to yeah, do that record. Yeah, to, yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Yeah. So all these things, you know, you feel you kind of, I felt like they're all like these little tests along the way that you kind of had to continue, you know, to, to pass and, you know, kind of move on to the next thing, you know. And we even, I'll, I'll just say one other thing. I even, we even saw that on the first record because there was, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of the success came from radio at the time and, you know, um, songs doing well at that, you know, format. Um, uh, you know, we were playing these radio festivals and, you know, we'd go there the first year and, you know, we're in the parking lot playing. And then you maybe make it to the main stage at like, you know, noon, one o'clock. And then the third time around, you know, you're playing like either headlining or right before the, you know what I mean? So you could kind of see the progression, sure. you know, by playing some of these things over and over and, you know, even just where you were playing. I've met people that'll say like, people treat you really different after you become famous and successful. And it's like lonely, you know, at times when you have that kind of success where you feel isolated. It has been an extremely lonely adventure it's it's really beyond anything that I can explain because you're surrounded by people everybody wants to get to you yep. but they can't because of the structure of all of it and the loneliness is consuming. That's why we all end up so fucked up. We've either turned to drugs, we've turned to alcohol, we've turned to illicit behavior, turned to all these things to fight off the and loneliness and emptiness and this void that just keeps growing inside you. You've been pulled away from everything that means anything to you. Your family, your wife, your home, everything is somewhere else. And that emptiness, it just fucking grows. And it consumes you. I don't have to contemplate very hard to understand why so many of my friends aren't here anymore. It's not at all what any everybody thinks it is. At all. It gets glamorized to such an extent because we're living our dreams. There's many forms of dreams. Nightmares are dreams, too. Yeah. You know? It, it, and I'm not saying that this has been a nightmare right. by any means at all. Right. I, I'm, I'm just saying that it, it ain't what it looks like from the outside. I recognize that that probably is a tough thing to deal with uh, as an artist, for sure. And talking about artists like... This is another record that had an impact on me, and it wasn't even... It was a remix record... Reanimation, Linkin Park, your remix of Crawling with them. What was your relationship like with Chester? One of those that was really close until our paths kind of changed. and That's one that fucks with me a little bit. Yeah. It was a profound loss. I, 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 I know what he was up against from word go before he was up against anything in the industry. And, uh, and we come from similar places. And, and we, we, we share a lot of the same childhood trauma. Um, 
you know, I've never just, I've just really never talked about it at all. Yeah. I've always steered clear of it. And he didn't. And I always, I always looked up to him for that, you know. Jonathan from Corn, another one. Just always looked up to him for having the fucking balls to say the shit that he said in songs. Chester fucks with me a lot. By the time you get to the end of a record, a lot of times you've listened to it and worked on it so much, you know, and they're sending you these mixes and you have to keep listening and listening and you're just like, oh my God, I don't want to... I, I just didn't feel that way. Right. I was happy to listen to it. I mean, I've actually, you know, been on a plane and went, I'm going to listen to the record. Yes. You know what I mean? And, and you know, just proud of the way they came out. And I look forward to for people. And listen, I know people don't buy records anymore, but I mean, hopefully they get to listen because I, I, I do think it's pretty strong yeah. all the way through. I think so too. And, and I've even seen that reaction from, you know, I've posted all about all the new music and other musicians uh, that follow the page are really excited about it too. Oh, so cool. like, you know, that was chronicled in like the documentary, wasn't it? That was, yeah. Yes. That was like a, that documentary, that documentary is edited like a motherfucker <laughs> too. And it was still y'all very, it was like some kind of monster. Y'all were very, we need that in rock in my opinion. Like I, I respect y'all for having the guts to show like, Hey, we're under pressure making this album. Maybe there was tension there at the time, you know, People, I think, are attracted towards what's Mike, real. At, at Mike and I, and all, the only reason I'll even say it is because I've, I've, I've heard him say it. it. He thought, he thought that I wrecked our fucking career. Mm -hmm. Like he thought that that record was the fucking worst piece of shit, including, was it Wannabe? Is Wannabe was on that fucking record? I think because so. I, was, I remember laughing about it. Oh my God, we were having so much fun writing it and just pissing our pants laughing. <laughs> and then Mike got it and Mike was like, I, I want to quit. Wow. But that was a, that was a rough, that was a rough record. Yeah. I respect John, you all. John, our original drummer, parted ways with us on that record. Mike was, Mike was ready to quit. Because he did just, he was so in it. It took him a good month or two when I got a phone call from him. Right. And I was like, and he was like, listen, I'm sorry. This record's incredible. I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I was buried in it. I apologize for saying the things that I said. And you guys have so much history and you've moved mountains together, you know, mm -hmm. and he seems very also when he when he was sort of telling sort of the early eras of Stained as well. You guys were so aspirational, like you weren't sitting around waiting for things to happen. Big thing, too, is when you get to that thing you're chasing, you have to be willing to walk through the fire to see what's on the other side. There's going to be a massive fire in front of you that you have to walk through. Mm to get to your goal. And the fire is obviously symbolic. Sure. But, but you have to walk through the fire. You can't repel from the fire. You're not gonna go anywhere. Right. That's, that's life in general. Yeah. Life in general. When, when, you, when you come to roadblocks, when you come to a forest fire, you have to walk through it to get to the other side. Yeah. And it usually is very rewarding yeah. when you do that. I've listened to the Confessions of the Fallen record. I've only gotten to listen to it once, but on first listen, it's a great fucking record. I honestly walked away from the recording process of that record feeling like it, it'll stand up against any yes. of our records. It really is. It's a quality. It, it, it might even be the best record that we've done yet. Yeah. Like I, I don't like saying things like that. Sure. Um, it's a really good but record. I certainly didn't walk away from it with any sort of reservations whatsoever how was the process I mean was it a stressful or like it 
everything seemed like you guys are all seem to be modern in, modern era bro yeah. stressful i didn't see anybody for the whole <laughs> entire recording process <laughs> that's crazy not one Wow. Mike did all of his stuff on his own. Johnny did all of his stuff on his own. Sal did everything on his own. And I did everything on my own. That's amazing. That's amazing. Do you think, I mean, where do We didn't you even do it all in the same spot. It was all over the place. As a selfish Stained fan, you think you guys are going to continue touring and finding some way to do that? You think like... Let's see how this tour goes. Yeah. I haven't... The, the thing about... The, the key difference between touring with Stained and touring solo for me is the overhead. Oh, yeah. So the overhead aspect doesn't really work very well with Stained for all of that production to sit while we go home for three days, like the country schedule. Yeah. Country schedules weekend warriors. Yes. They, that's why Nashville is such a great spot, because it's a perfect hub for most of the country. Right. You can drive out of Nashville the night before and arrive at your venue in the morning. So I, I haven't done this for a while, even though I work really hard. Yeah. I haven't done the the rock tour which is Tuesday nights it doesn't matter what night it is it's three in a row a day off two in a row a day off three in a row etc etc it just perpetually keeps going it doesn't matter whether it's a weekend night or a Monday night right. doesn't matter that's a harder schedule to keep even if I'm playing five days a week I still get to go home on Sunday and Monday and right. kind of ground myself for a second. So. That's the challenge. We just, we'll just give us Stained at Festivals. Uh, uh, that, Stained at Festivals, festivals are easy. Yeah. Festivals are easy. It's, you know, you're rarely playing a full headlining set. Festivals are easy. Festivals are fun. I would, the the thing with festivals is that they're driven by radio play, and we yeah. haven't been on the radio for, aside from our old stuff, for so long. Lowe's to me's doing great at radio, though. I think. I think it's it, about to go it number one. Just maybe? officially went number one. Congrats, so. man! That's awesome. But I'm up against Jelly, <laughs> and all Jelly's people have to do. Because he's so intertwined into the new way of getting to everybody. So all he really has to do is his people just have to notice that all of a sudden he's not in number one anymore and they'll just amp it up. And who knows whether I'll be, whether Stained will be sitting at number one tomorrow or not. <laughs> but today, today, for an hour or two, <laughs> we got through Jelly's... Well, it's, Front lines. it's well deserved because it, it is a great song. Well, Aaron, I am so grateful to you, man. I am such a fan of Stained. I love your country stuff. It's been an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it right before my battery dies. <laughs> Perfect. Aaron Lewis, everybody.